Owning Regina, Audiobook Part 8. Welcome to the podcast version of the lesbian romance novel Owning Regina, which is available in print and Kindle versions on Amazon.com. Additionally, Amazon.com will carry the unabridged audiobook version of the novel once it has been completed. If you are new to this podcast, please start with episode one so that you can enjoy the complete progression of the story. I'm Hunter Keenan, your narrator, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Owning Regina, Diary of My Unexpected Passion for Another Woman by Lorelei Elstrom. This diary has been fictionalized in order to protect the privacy of certain individuals. Though it may bear striking similarities to real-life situations, people, and relationships, any such depictions are purely coincidental. Sunday, April 8th, Out and About. I woke up this morning feeling great about life. There were no plans to see Regina. Of course, that's what I said yesterday, before the whole dishwashing and blazeman business. But I think Regina and I felt comfortable in letting the day pass without being too clingy. That kiss last night will keep me going for quite a while. Instead of drinking my coffee at home, I decided to cruise over to Pacific Heights to have breakfast at The Grove, a hip coffee joint I've always liked. It's fun to go there because I can window shop in some of the most exclusive shops in San Francisco. Once, I saw some Donna Karen boots there that were $1,920. Really, I'm not shitting. The funny thing was, they looked like they were worth every penny. It's hard for people to understand what separates a $2,000 pair of boots from a pair that costs $200. Some people think the difference is merely in having a designer label slapped on, but that's completely false. When I go shopping in Barney's or Nordstrom, I always gravitate toward the most amazing boots on the floor. Many have no clear designer markings at all, but when I turn the boot over to see the price at the bottom, bam, there it is. A shoe with a price tag of over $1,000. I have good taste. The difference is in how finely the boot is made, stitching quality, nuance in the shape, type of materials, workmanship, etc., The high-end designer shoes and boots have a certain gravitas, a feel of importance that the $100 shoes lack. For that matter, it's the same with couture clothing and bags versus the cheaper ones. Maybe they would look similar in a photograph, but in real life the difference stands out like a tulip in the snow. Needless to say, I'm not going around dropping 2K on shoes. However, I've always heard that male shoe and boot fetishists, guys with really serious fetishes, would buy you shoes and clothes and send them to you free. The only catch is you have to pose in them and post the pictures online. I've heard they want you to thank them online and do particular poses to prove they had the control over you in the photo. Bragging rights, I guess. This whole idea really intrigues me. But I could never do it. Exposing anything too specific or personal on the net really freaks me out. No way. Instead... I will just have to settle for walking along Fillmore Street for some window shopping on my way to the Grove. Anyway, excuse the sidebar. I had a nice breakfast and some great coffee while I took my time reading the paper and answering emails on my laptop. After a while, Regina called. Since I was in the restaurant, I spoke quietly in my phone's mic. She said I sounded sexy. I told her that I really wanted to dial in the rules for our game and PDAs so that nobody especially Tucker, and our co-workers get surprised with something uncomfortable or confusing. She was totally on board, and we decided on the following. Rule number one, the game needs a complete start and stop, no sliding in and out of it. Rule number two, if we are in the game and the real world intervenes or calls for our immediate attention, it's perfectly okay to step out of the game without using the code or getting the other person's approval. Rule number three. Rule number two is only valid when not exiting the game could result in bad consequences. Mild awkwardness or embarrassments are not grounds for stopping the game. For example, when I hold Regina firmly by her wrist while walking along may be embarrassing to her, but will not result in real-world bad consequences. Therefore, 
I can always hold her by the wrist in public when we are in the game. Rule number four, neither slave nor master can commit acts that would be physically, legally, or financially harmful to either party. Of course, by physically, we mean permanent or potentially permanent harm. Bruises and other temporary physical harm is okay, so long as it doesn't cause problems in our real-world environments. Rule number five, we are never allowed to play the game in anger or as a real-world tool to work out issues in our relationship. For example, it's not okay for me to physically torture Regina to get her to reveal real-world private thoughts, how she feels about a certain subject, whether she flirts with anybody else, etc. Rule number six, verbal abuse or anything said in the game is never allowed to be tied to our real-world feelings. In the game, I may call her a pathetic piece of trash, and she may shout out, stop whipping me, you heartless bitch, but that's only related to the characters in the game, period. Rule number seven, absolutely no photographs within the game, ever. Rule number eight, we never tell anybody else when we are playing the game or not. We never disclose what we are doing. It is 100% personal. Nobody needs to know what we are doing because even though we may be in public, it is very intimate and sexual. We both felt strongly that these rules, a sort of constitution of kink, would really help us to keep things clear. We both get so fully transformed in our game characters that these rules are necessary. Now we have parameters to help keep the flow from overrunning its banks. There is a time to let the kink run wildly and a time to be present in the real world. After sorting all that out, we had a little more chit-chat before she had to go. She was taking Tucker and Jason to the roller rink. That would be so fun to skate with her. I got through a few emails and finished up my coffee at the Grove. Just when I was about to close down my computer, an email popped in from my mom. She invited me over for dinner next Saturday. Jenna and Mark would be there. It was just a simple invitation, but the implications were huge. My sister and her husband and my parents would each have their significant others there. Was I supposed to go there as usual and pretend I'm single? Am I supposed to be a fifth wheel? Am I supposed to pretend I'm still incomplete and incapable of finding a quality relationship partner? Do I bring Regina as my new friend? It's not like I used to bring Victoria over there. Do I announce that I have a girlfriend? Do I say I'm gay? Maybe I respectfully decline the dinner and say I'm booked. But that only prolongs the inevitable. At one point, I'm going to have to deal with this. Unless, of course, Regina and I break up and I turn full straight. Then it would be a non-issue if I postponed. But honestly, what are the chances of Regina and I breaking up anytime soon, if ever? The way it's going, I'm already deeply in love and feel like I want to go the long haul with her. I'm positive she feels the same way. I can't believe I'm faced with all these questions from a single invitation to dinner. Could I really come right out and say, I'm gay? I don't feel gay. I just feel in love. Fuck. But I suppose if I'm in love with a woman and have sex with her, I'm gay. I could just hear myself now. Hi, Mom and Dad. A few weeks ago, I met this amazing woman, and now I'm gay. Great. But you know what? That's pretty much the way it happened. I'm a lesbian. I'm not bi because I haven't thought about Dick a single time since meeting Regina. If I were bi... I would probably be having straight fantasies, but I don't at all. I can't imagine ever missing straightness, especially since there are plenty of toys available to accomplish the same thing without all the heartaches of being with a dude. You know what would be super hot? I'd love to force slave Regina to fuck me in the ass with a dildo. Guys always love to put it in the ass, but with Regina handling the tool, I think the experience could be amazing because she would be sensitive to me as a woman. It wouldn't be merely wham, ram, thank you, ma'am. Sidebar. I think I should start having Slave Regina service me more as a top. 
I could order her to be dominant and mean to me as part of the game, like my minion. She would still be submissive, but playing the role of dominatrix by means of satisfying my orders to her. Make sense? Anyway, back to this dinner thing. I talked myself through it. I need to come out and introduce Regina as my lovely girlfriend. Life's too short to pretend otherwise. I will bring our relationship into the sunshine. If you think there's a boogeyman, turn the light on. Too premature, you say? Have you ever heard of love at first sight? It's a real thing. When you have it, you know. I've never had it before Regina, but now I know for sure. She's my angel. We were meant to cross each other's paths at this time in our lives. Next question. Do I tell my parents and sister in advance or spring it on them at the dinner? In the mere act of asking that question, I discovered my own answer. I need to tell them in advance. There's no need for drama or surprise. Dear Diary, I just did it. I'm out. I texted Regina to see if she could make the date. She said she could. Then, I responded to my mom's email and cc'd my sister with the following. Dinner sounds great. I'd love to make it. Also, I have some news. I met someone and I'm in love. Would it be okay to bring her to the dinner too? Yes, you read that right. It's a her. I'm in love with a woman. She's amazing. Love, Meg. My mom wrote back five minutes later, Wow, congratulations. We're a bit surprised, but happy for you. We are only surprised because we never saw any indication that you had those leanings. She also had a few questions about how we met, where she lives, etc. I responded honestly. Jenna wrote back too. Glad you can make it. We'll see you both there. For me, Jenna's omission of any questions about details led me to read between the lines that she either didn't approve of me being a lesbian or was terrified of it. Either way, it felt a little cold. But I don't blame her. It's like my mom said, we never saw any indications that you had those leanings. It was clearly out of left field for Jenna. It's okay if it takes her some time to digest it all, especially since she thinks it's against the Bible. <laughs> Can you imagine what she would think if I told her I want to put Regina in a corset, handcuff her to a post and French kiss her while pinching her nipples? Ooh. After these emails, I called Regina to tell her how it all went down. She seemed really tickled and bubbly that I would be so bold as to officially call her my girlfriend and that I had the conviction to tell my family I was in love. I'm pretty sure Regina thought we would continue in the dark for a while, so she seemed delighted that we could come out as ourselves. And actually, it wasn't really as hard as I had made it up in my mind to be. Maybe Jenna is judging me behind my back. But I'm true to myself, and my relationship seems less shameful now that it's in the open. It should be an interesting dinner. Later in the day, Regina and I talked on the phone for about an hour about nothing in particular. It's so nice to fit with someone so well that conversation flows so comfortably. I went to bed happy. Monday, April 9th, Paper Doll. Damn, I had the worst headache when I woke up this morning. I think I had too much dark chocolate before going to bed. I was channel surfing and popping chocolate squares like they were grapes. I've had this headache before for the same reason. Late night chocolate gives me headaches and salty food makes me puffy in the mornings. It's only a couple more days until Regina is mine again. Don't get me wrong. Tucker is wonderful, and I respect their time together, but I need my girlfriend back. We texted back and forth for a bit in the morning, but at lunch, our usual time for connecting during the work week, she was booked in some faculty crap. So I took my laptop to a restaurant and surfed the net for new boots I could send Regina for fun. I found these extremely hot Ugg boots called Georgette. I know it sounds impossible for Uggs to be sexy, 
but these shoes are killer. They are actually booties, which isn't usually my thing. They kind of look like a high clog with fur lining around the top. The stacked wooden heel is super high. They look really natural and casual and would be fantastic with jeans. I ordered a pair for Regina and had them mailed directly to her house. I can't wait for the day when she wears them out with me on a casual date for a beer. I love the idea of dressing down, maybe with a tee under a flannel shirt, and having these suede heels as a show of nonchalant sexiness. It's fun to think that I own her and can dress her any way I want, just like a paper doll. In the evening, Regina was busy with Tucker and grading papers. At one point, we were Skyping, and Tucker commandeered the camera and started mugging and using an app to make crazy funhouse mirror faces to me. We were all cracking up. After he got bored and went away, Regina gave me a sweet goodnight kiss right on the lens. I felt it on my lips. Tuesday, April 10th, apart but together. Nothing much happened today. Regina and I exchanged a few emails and greetings about missing each other, but there was nothing else interesting outside of that. Oh, there was one thing. In a phone conversation this evening, Regina and I decided on a fun little game to play at yoga on Wednesday night when we were both finally together again. Don't worry, dear diary. It's not a kinky game. You can get your head out of the gutter now. We thought it would be fun and interesting to go to yoga and pretend that we weren't friends or lovers. We won't have seen each other in a while, and it will be a challenge to try to pretend like we were indifferent about each other's presence. I'm not really sure how this concept materialized in the phone conversation. I think it was Regina who was kind of wondering out loud what it would be like to see each other with fresh eyes. Then that notion morphed into this little plan where we would pretend to be apathetic about each other. We both thought it would be exciting to feel all that pent-up romance for each other and not be able to act or dive into it, like that same buzz kids feel on Christmas Eve. There are presents under the tree, but you can't open them until the next day. Hopefully, our little activity of feigning apathy will not end in some kind of catastrophic explosion of hurt feelings. But we thought it was worth the risk and vowed to always try new things in our relationship so it will never turn stale. It's late now and I'm typing while wearing my corset. I'm going to tie my ankles together to sleep tonight. I told Regina about it and it seemed to arouse her. We agreed that exactly 11 p.m. we would both masturbate together. Even though we would be in different locations, it was a way to connect. Nighty night. At the tone, the exact time will be 11 o'clock. Wednesday, April 11th. Strangers all over again. Good morning, diary. Are you male or female? Never mind. That was a stupid question. You are a female. I had such a great sleep. I just came from the shower. Regina and I had great sex last night. How do I know that? Because she texted me this morning and said she did the 11 o'clock thing just like I did. Today is the big day, and we finally get to be with each other again since she will no longer be on mommy duty for a while. I'm really excited to show up at yoga and not give her a hug. She said she's excited about it, too. I'm going to treat her just like any other woman in class. Of course, my heart is probably going to be racing with excitement underneath the blasé facade. Who would have ever thought that pretending not to be lovers with someone would be hot? Does anyone else do that? We must be freaks. At lunch, we Skyped for a few minutes. 
She looked so cute. It was really fun seeing her smiling, beautiful face. Dear Diary, don't tell her this, but I was scrutinizing her face during the video call. She has this little way her nostrils flare out at the sides whenever she's smiling. Her eyes are so full of life and excitement, which radiate a playful, inquisitive, and slightly mischievous energy. God only knows what she sees on my end. After work, it was finally time for yoga. I had literally been counting the minutes. I walked up each step toward the class with ever more anticipation. When I arrived at class, I quickly scanned the people in the room. Regina hadn't arrived yet. I put out my mat and started stretching. A few moments later, a new girl walks in. Actually, it was Regina incognito. <laughs> she was dressed like a totally different person. Instead of her usual yoga pants and tank top, she wore cobalt blue short shorts and a navy boyfriend tee. And, get this charcoal thigh-high leg warmers. Her hair was done in a loose off-center braid that fell to the front of her right shoulder. Even though she's 38, the outfit completely worked on her. The effect felt classy and stylish in a whole different way than her usual self. Clearly, she was taking this whole stranger concept to a new level I had never expected. I was dressed as my usual self. Boring. I wish I had been more creative like her. She placed her mat about five women away from me, never giving me eye contact. I tried to ignore her, but the truth is, every time I thought I could get away with it, I stole glances at her. Maybe she did the same to me, but I really got the sense that she was completely in character and never broke to spy on me. There was this secretive energy between us that felt really fun and devious. Well, at least it felt that way to me. Every once in a while, our teacher initiates partnering up. There are a whole bunch of yoga poses that are done with partners. So today of all days, it was partner day. We all had to pair up. The woman next to me asked to be my partner. Regina asked someone behind her to pair up. So there we were, stretching and doing these intimate poses with real strangers. I wish I could have been partnered with Regina, but that's not the way the dice rolled in our little game today. The woman I was working with was pleasant enough, but I had absolutely no connection to her and will probably forget her face by bedtime. As we were going through the motions, I kept thinking how sexual all these poses would have been if I were with Regina. In spying on Regina, it seemed she had a bigger connection to her partner, an athletic-looking woman I had never seen in class before. They seemed to be having fun and an awful lot of eye contact and smiles all the while intertwining their bodies in various ways. Okay, I admit it. I became a bit jealous. I kept thinking that Regina's natural charisma wasn't for me alone. Maybe she was capable of charming others like she had with me. At first, I thought there was a unique energy between us. But the more I watched her with this new yoga partner, the more I thought that maybe Regina simply shines her light on whomever is present it's threatening to think that she could find someone else to connect with so easily. But there is no reason to be jealous. It must have been just a bad head trip I was playing on myself. Maybe I was reading into their connection. Perhaps Regina was merely friendly in a polite way to make the other woman feel relaxed. Perhaps her seeming connection to this woman was merely a superficial part of our little game in an attempt to heighten our stranger experience. Well, if that were the case... Regina sure was doing a great job of playing buddy-buddy with her partner. Just when I had almost had enough, the teacher called for us to go back to our individual mats, and not a moment too soon. I was really starting to get resentful and hurt. What a stupid game. We did our warm down and brief meditation. When class was wrapping up, Regina stepped to the drinking fountain, and I found myself right next to Regina's partner. I couldn't help myself by probing the woman with, how'd you like the partner yoga? It was great, commented the woman who introduced herself as Nancy. She continued, it's always easier when you have a little history together. I felt my stomach sink like a rock, especially when I took note of Nancy's sporty appearance. Oh, you two have a history? Just then Regina walked up. Nancy pulled her over to meet me. 
This is my sister-in-law, Regina. Regina was clearly sensing that I was flummoxed for some reason. Hello, Regina, I said. I've seen you around class quite a bit. Regina is a wonderful person to know, said Nancy, before continuing to Regina with, Technically, I'm not really your sister-in-law anymore since you're divorced from my brother, right? They both laughed. Regina continued with, Anyway, maybe Nancy has a point. Would you care to join me for some soup around the corner? We could get to know each other. Nancy chimed in, Great idea. Then you can be partners next time if I'm not here. Regina and I smiled at each other with a secret wink. I was so relieved that Regina's ex-sister-in-law was just her ex-sister-in-law. She's... Regina and I both changed out of our yoga clothes at the studio. When Regina emerged from the bathroom, I almost had a heart attack at how she looked. She was wearing the new Ugg booties I got her. I didn't even expedite the shipping, and she already had them. With the shoes, she wore a camel pencil skirt that went to her knees. Tucked into it was a crispy white blouse with a stand-up collar, and the coup de grace. Around her neck was that impossibly sexy brown leather slave collar, the three-inch wide one that looks like it was cut down from a high-end designer belt. The collar was a stunning accent to the outfit. Plus, it made me want to dominate her. Her hair was no longer in the side braid, but rather in a high ponytail. She looked super cosmopolitan, like Vogue New York. Neither of us seemed to know how to exit the stranger game. I made the understated comment, cute outfit. She responded with, thanks, yours too. I was wearing a black turtleneck, black tights, and our brick red boots. It was awkward because we stayed in character and didn't know how to get out of the scene. It wasn't our regular game, and I wasn't the mistress. We went to the restaurant and sat at a booth. Even as the waitress took our order, I was conflicted about if I should break the stranger game or not. Regina seemed like she was completely fine as strangers, but I really wanted to be with Regina, Regina. So I pulled a ruse. I pretended to check my phone as if it had been vibrating. Oh no, I worried aloud. I have to go help a friend. Sorry, but I'm going to have to leave. Regina sat in confusion as I hastily disappeared out the front door. She looked so sad as I was walking out, kind of like a bomb had just dropped on her. Outside the restaurant, I waited about 30 seconds before racing back in as I called out, Regina, I'm so sorry I'm late. She perked up and a wry smile came upon her. I walked over and gave her a kiss right on the lips. I missed you so much. Thanks for waiting for me. I had some problems being stuck with a stranger. Long story. Regina was beaming and chuckling. We were back as ourselves. I don't know why I felt compelled to exit our game that way instead of just telling her that we should be ourselves, but it seemed kind of like our kinky game that we both had thrown ourselves so deeply into character and into believing the circumstances that it would feel embarrassing and awkward to break character without some type of exit device. It would be like if you were watching a stage play and the actor all of a sudden broke character and said, can you excuse me for a couple of minutes? I got to move my car before the meter expires. But if the play ends and you see the actor in the lobby, you would expect that he or she would have left the character on the stage to become a regular person again. Regina and I need that type of transition. Plus, it feels emotionally safer to know when we are in character in the character's world. We won't be judged for acting strange because it's all part of a stage act. So there I was in the restaurant with the real Regina. I went over to her side of the booth and slid next to her. It felt like we were both love-struck. We were very tactile, holding hands, playing with each other's hair. Just as in the play analogy, it feels okay to talk about everything once it's officially concluded. Our conversation went like this. Thank God Nancy is your ex-sister-in-law. To be perfectly honest, I was jealous about your familiarity with her. I thought she was a virtual stranger to you and that you were flirting with her. I could sense something was going on with you. Were you aware of me at yoga? I got the impression you totally shut me out as part of the game. Are you kidding? I have Megdar. It's like radar. I'm telepathically tuned into you. 
We both chuckled and then took a pause to eat and breathe. The conversation continued. Other than Nancy, did you think the game was sexy? It was so sexy. I loved seeing you and not being able to jump on you. It was mental bondage. Your outfit was fantastic. You look like a completely different girl. Different girl? But you would never want that in the real world, right? God, no. Me neither. You know what? What? I have never done any kind of role-playing before in relationships. It's so fun. I'm thrilled that you're cool with it. Cool with it? It's dreamy hot. Speaking of hot, your collar is driving me insane. I really want to fuck with you in a dungeon. Her eyes flirted with the fantasy. We snuggled close, and I leaned my head on her shoulder. Just then, a piercing voice interrupted. Hi, Mrs. Baker. Crap, it was Amanda, one of Regina's fifth grade students with her dad in tow. They busted over to our table. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Mr. Swenson. How are you two? We're great. We just saw Farfetch'd. Oh, that's the movie about the toy dog who wants to be real, right? Yep. It was, uh, it was pretty clever. I give it about four out of five stars. This is my dear friend, Meg. Mr. Swenson looked like he was calculating the odds that we were merely dear friends. Of course, he had a lot to work with since Regina and I had been practically drooling over each other. He also spent a decent amount of time staring at her leather collar. Come on, Amanda. Let's let them get back to their dinner. Okay. Bye, Mrs. Baker. As they were leaving, Amanda turned back around for one last comment. Your collar is really pretty. Thank you, Amanda. See you in class. Well, it was nice meeting you, Meg. Likewise. Have a good evening. Regina gave a cute little wave as they left. Does that bother you? What? That your school half sees this half. No, it doesn't bother me. Better than running into me sloppy drunk in a bar. <laughs> I mean, the fact that you're with me. I know what you meant. It doesn't bother me. Luckily... We live in the progressive state of California, in the even more progressive city of San Francisco. People can be themselves. Do you want to go home with me and play a different kind of game? Would you be cool if I slept over? That's very forward of you. You're right. Please don't tell that mean mistress friend of yours. She has it out for me. No worries. We can go to my house and play cards or something. And yes, Miss Baker, I'd love for you to sleep over. Thursday, April 12th. You're fucking awesome. Insane. When we got to my house last night, we jumped into the game... The real game, not the stranger game, and kept it up until 6.45 a.m. when my alarm clock went off to get Regina to school in time. Here's what happened. We got back to my house, and we were both feeling really connected to each other. I poured us each a glass of wine, and we sat on the sofa. Regina was sitting with her legs crossed, favoring her new high heels toward me. She looked like such a femme fatale. I wanted to see this femme fatale with a stogie between her lips. Luckily, I happened to have one upstairs that my dad had given me a while back when I expressed interest. Nobody in my family smokes. Neither Regina nor I smoke, but I still thought it would be hot to see her smoke a cigar. Normally, it would freak me out to smoke anything in my house. It's completely off limits, but my libido got the best of me and I threw caution to the wind. I wanted to see this femme fatale with that stogie between her lips. Regina thought the idea sounded disgusting. I knew she thought that because she said, no fucking way am I smoking a cigar. <laughs> uh, but with a little coaxing from my dimpled smile, she was sparking up five minutes later. She coughed a little at first, prompting a round of giggles until I told her, you're not supposed to inhale cigars. We hadn't started the game yet, and she was not being ordered by her mistress to smoke the cigar. I stepped across the room to watch her smoke it. The image was every bit as perfect as I had envisioned. 
white blouse, heavy brown leather slave collar, pencil skirt with crossed legs, beautiful hair, and the perfect self-righteous attitude she had suddenly assumed. She ignored me as I watched her, as if she was alone in the room. After savoring the sight for a while, I couldn't take it anymore from a distance. I needed to shut her down and take control. I wanted to own her sexually. But just when I was about to get into action, she stunned me by puffing on the cigar and invoking the game with, Can you believe how blue the sky is today? I wondered, since she was the one who initiated the game, did she all of a sudden want to be dominant? She certainly looked the part in her femme fatale outfit, but I wasn't in the mood to be submissive to my own fucking slave. It was time to jump into my bitch self and ask, yes, slave, exactly what did you want to say? Slave Regina, in full game mode, shot back, I have missed you terribly, dear mistress. I'm lost without your discipline. Feeling more and more of the edginess of the game developing, I said, and so you took it upon yourself to enter my world? She nodded. I approached her quickly and grabbed her face firmly. A nod is not a respectful answer. Oh. And I slapped her face briskly, causing her involuntarily to let out a scream. After recovering, she looked at me deeply in the eyes and pleaded, I crave you, mistress. No more chatter from you, I scolded sharply. Then I continued with, stand up. She stood obediently. I reached up her skirt and removed her panties, then hiked her skirt up to allow full access to her pussy and stunning ass. Handing the edges of her skirt to her hands, I had her hold her own skirt up for me. I sat on the sofa and told her, pretend I'm a man in a high-end strip club and give me a lap dance. When the bouncers aren't watching, kissing and fondling is okay. Thank you, mistress. She beamed with flames of lust in her eyes. Straddling me, she put part of her weight across my thighs as I sat. Slowly, she gyrated and started caressing her tits. She wasn't doing it as a mere gesture. From her core, she was emotionally immersed in and connected to the scene. We were both really warming up. After a while, she reached over with both hands and started playing with my breasts. First, her hands were over my turtleneck, but soon she had slipped her hands up my shirt. I paused briefly to undo my bra. When her warm hands hit the raw skin of my breasts, it was unbelievable. She was slowly riding my thighs while playing with my breasts in perfect rhythm. A moment later, I was treated to her lips contacting mine in a loose mouth kiss that rambled and rolled from my face to my ears to my mouth to my neck. I put my middle finger between her legs from the back as she continued her lap dance. My fingers gently traced the moisture of her pussy. Once my fingers were completely wet, I slowly stuck my middle finger up inside her. That caused her to make these yummy moaning sounds as I started thrusting my middle finger in and out. I slid my body down the sofa between her legs so that my mouth was right at her clit as she clutched the back of the couch, kneeling on the cushions over my face. With my fingers still penetrating her, I tenderly massaged her clit with my tongue. Gauging her reactions carefully, I would alternate licking with pushing my tongue into her vagina alongside my finger. She was a flaming mess of erotic frenzy, moaning and jerking and borderline crying. Sensing she was extremely close, I thrust into her harder and deeper with my finger. She was starting to tremble from overstimulation combined with her thighs weakening from the thrusting in the lap dance. She exploded into a painfully sexy moan with a very strained utterance of, I love you, mistress. I love you. The smoke had cleared. I told her to go clean up, compose herself change into some of my jammies upstairs and then call me when she was nice and calm. Yes, mistress. She complied with relaxed joy in her voice. A while later, she called me up to the bedroom. I hugged her warmly to make a nice connection for a moment. Then I told her, 
your outfit tonight was quite dominant and audacious for a slave. To deepen your understanding of me, we need to switch perspectives. I want you to chain me, spread eagled, face down in the bed with each of my arms and legs secured to the bedposts so that there's no way for me to escape. You will use your creativity and intuition to get me to come by any means possible, gesturing to my growing box of kink toys on the closet floor. I don't want to hear a peep from your mouth. Is that perfectly clear? She knelt down before me and clearly nodded silently in order to obey my command of silence. I put my hand on her throat as she knelt there. Just because I will be restrained doesn't mean you are in control. You will always be my slave, I sternly reminded. Then I slapped her lovely cheek quite firmly. She took my hand and kissed the palm gently, assuring me that she was still my pet. I knelt down to her level, looked straight in her eyes, and then indicated she should stand over me, which she did. You may now execute my command. She stared down at me for a moment, coming to grips with her new dominant authority. I stared back, ordering her with my eyes to take charge. Ah! She shocked me with a cold slap to my face. She did it with unflinching resolve and, being solidly in character, gave no hint of remorse. At first, I was taken aback. She seemed to have moved too quickly and easily to the dominant mindset. It was almost instant, and especially out of place coming from an adorable girl in pajamas. But then again, I did get the sense she was deeply invested in the slave role and wanted to please me to the strongest degree. If I ordered her to be dominant, she would be dominant. If I ordered her to lick my feet, she would do that just as obediently, with full passion to please me. Still, I can't believe she hauled off and slapped me in the face without an apology. Relationship experts say that sexual partners do to their mate what they like done to themselves. I thought this would be interesting to see what Regina would do to me sexually when given free reign. I thought perhaps I would discover some deeper ways to please her, but mostly I wanted to feel her authority. After the slap, she stared at me coldly for a moment before guiding me to stand up. Once I was standing, she stripped me naked with clinical detachment tossing my clothes on the floor in a pile. But she made me put back on our brick red boots, which really turned me on. In the same detached expression, she directed me to lie in the bed. Then she went to my toy box in the closet and pulled out four lengths of heavy chain with which she tied my ankles and wrists to the corner bedposts. The cold steel felt intimidating on my wrists. The pressure of the chain through the leather on my boots was a delight. Being face down with my nude ass exposed, I felt really vulnerable as Regina's mistress. The possibilities of what could come were extremely arousing. There could be kisses, a massage, a whipping, or even something shoved up my ass. It was all at Regina's whim. I decided to completely give up control and go with the idea of being a bottom. She rooted around in my underwear drawer and came up with my corset, which she put around my waist. She began lacing and cinching tighter than I have ever felt. She must have spent ten minutes pulling and gathering until my torso was so constricted that only the shallowest of breathing was permitted. I had created a monster. She wasn't done yet. She took her wide leather collar that she had been wearing and strapped it around my neck, cinching it to the tightest notch. Now who is the slave? The collar said it all. It was like Wonder Woman's lasso. Whoever is in its grasp is rendered completely helpless and submissive. She found a knitted wool hat in my closet and pulled it over my head, all the way over my eyes. Then she disappeared for a couple of minutes, presumably to go to the garage. When she returned, she had some duct tape and made dozens of runs around my head over the knitted hat. It was scary to feel completely blindfolded like that. There was no chance in hell I would ever be able to see a single thing. The compression of the tape was so tight that I wouldn't even be able to open my eyelids if my life depended on it. Next, she shoved my own dirty sock in my mouth, the ones I was wearing in my boots before she stripped me down. 
She continued with the duct tape treatment by going around and around the back of my head, over the knit cap, and across my mouth, sealing in the sock. Only my nostrils were exposed. It was pretty frightening. There was literally no way for me to talk or end the game with that was some kind of crazy day I had. Basically, I was fucked. She straddled me, sitting over my ass, and then reached in front to play with my tits. It was wildly exciting to be so helpless and objectified under her. She kissed my neck and gently squeezed my nipples with little pulses of pressure. As I got more and more turned on, my breathing became more difficult. I couldn't get very much air through my nose, especially with the corset constriction. She sat upright over my ass. With one hand, she began massaging my vulva. With the other hand, she was rubbing my back above the corset. I was really getting turned on, to say the least. Again, she disappeared for a moment. When she returned, she straddled my corset, facing toward my feet. She played with my ass gently for a bit before I felt some lube being applied to my asshole. I felt a rounded, elongated object slowly entering me in the ass. I would later find out it was the handle of my designer ice cream scoop that was inside a condom. She penetrated it really deep inside of me with one hand as she played with my clit with her other hand. I was struggling to breathe against the corset and duct taped mouth and it was quite terrifying to be blindfolded and restrained all at the same time. After the scoop handle was all the way inside me, she left it there and inserted a dormant vibrator up my pussy. With the exception of my nose, every orifice I had was either covered or filled. She got off of me and knelt beside me on the bed. Because I was restrained, filled up and constricted in every way possible, any touch on my skin from Regina felt magnified by 100 times. I could even feel her breath even though her mouth was an arm's length away from my skin. She began caressing me all over my body. It was a massage of the lightest touch imaginable. Her fingers felt like cotton balls gently rolling across my pores. Ever so gradually over the course of 15 minutes, She delivered more pressure until it had turned into a full massage. She was working my muscles in knots. Sometimes I would feel her elbow doing the craft and sometimes it was her fingertips. She massaged in slow, rhythmic strokes and circles. Intermittently, I could feel her chin digging my knots and could feel her hot breath on my skin. I loved imagining what I must have looked like to Regina. I was floating in sensuality lost in swirling thoughts of passion that had me exiting the physical body to an altered state of sexual intoxication. I felt her warm left hand leave massage duty on my back while the right hand continued. In one smooth and controlled move, she pinched my nose closed so that I couldn't breathe at all. My whole being burst into a state of alarm. I was petrified. How long would she cut off my breathing? After about 30 seconds, I was starting to lose my breath. I started squirming and fighting the restraints and vocalizing in grunts for her to stop, but she kept my nose sealed. I started really freaking out. I was thrashing violently against the chains and becoming blinded with desperation. Even so, I felt outside of myself and surfing the buzz of a sexual drug. Everything was turning white and I burst into full panic mode. Just as I felt like I might black out, she released my nose. I sucked in all the air I could from my nose, but it wasn't enough. I needed more air. Regina instantly picked up on this. She grabbed some scissors from my nightstand and cut in the duct tape to release my mouth and remove the sock gag. Thank God. I gasped for breath while she rubbed me tenderly to calm me down. After a good two minutes, I was in a better place, 
coming off the sex drug and back to myself in the game. Just then, she got the duct tape and re-taped my mouth shut again. Fuck! I wanted to see. I wanted to be unrestrained. I was terrified. But Regina took this shit seriously. She turned on the vibrator that had been shoved at my pussy, causing me to yelp from the surprise. It felt amazing. Instantly, the restraints felt good again. Being tightly blindfolded was adding to the sensation. She played with the ice cream scoop in my ass while the vibrator ran in my pussy. Just when I was about to erupt with a volcanic orgasm, she left me for a moment. (gasps) I felt the leather belt hit my ass, the same ass that had been stuffed with the ice cream scoop. Smack! Smack! She continued. The blows were steady and firm. After about 20 hits, my ass was starting to sting and burn like crazy. I was unable to tell her to stop. I was unable to hold my hands in protection over my butt. I was exposed, but she kept at it. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I started to whimper and cry. It was involuntary. Tears were flowing through the knit cap all over my eyes. Finally, she stopped. She gave me a hug against my tied up body. The contact of her flannel pajamas against my skin felt splendid. Slowly, she pulled out the vibrator and the condom covered ice cream scoop. Then she unchained my ankles and gestured for me to pull my legs up to support my ass up high, a bondage version of downward dog. My arms were still chained as she crawled under my pussy and began the most serious cunnilingus in the world. Her warm tongue against my clit felt like fireworks. I have never sensed such direct and powerful stimulation. She moved her tongue sensually and expertly with tremendous awareness of what I was experiencing, reading my every moan and quiver to maximize the effect. Finally, I blasted into orgasm. It had a strong start and just kept growing. My whole body was quaking and throbbing. I couldn't breathe well due to the corset and duct tape, but it added to the sensation of being so constricted. It felt like I was in some swirling kaleidoscope of orgasm, steaminess, and flashes of Regina controlling me. I was living the Helmut Newton themes. It wasn't multiple orgasms, as much as it was a continuous orgasmic wave pushing me along. After what seemed like several minutes, I closed my legs over Regina's face to indicate that I was completely spent and couldn't take it another second. She quickly read my hint and stopped. Next, she went to my head and carefully cut away the duct tape from my eyes and mouth. Then she pulled off the whole knit cap with the tape on it. Surprisingly, none of the tape had adhered to my hair, and she got me clear without pulling a single strand. The second my mouth was free to breathe easily, I gasped in as much air as I could, but I was still constrained by the ultra-tight corset. Regina, very in touch with my needs, quickly unlaced and removed the corset. She licked my middle back where the corset had made imprints into my skin. She took off her collar that I had been forced to wear, and at last, she unchained my wrist and set me completely free. When I was able to pull my aching body off the bed, I saw Regina kneeling in a very submissive pose at the foot of the bed. Her head was down, and she had put the collar back on her cell. It clashed quite a bit with her pajamas, but the meaning was clear. She was silent, just staring at the floor with her hands behind her back. Rather than jump right over to her to express my profound appreciation for all she had given me, I left the bed and headed straight for the shower. She stayed motionless, kneeling with her head down at the foot of my bed. The warm water felt incredible against my tortured skin. It felt so good to feel the blood rushing to all the places that had been constricted. I rubbed my wrist and ankles in the heated water and let the spray wash away the pain and tension of the session. 
I lathered my head with chamomile shampoo and then held my face directly under the shower head for a lingering rinse off. There wasn't a cell in my body that wasn't relaxed, if not completely spent. After the shower, I put on my thick terry cloth robe and headed back to Regina, who was still kneeling at the foot of the bed. Even though she had made the mess, I decided to clean up after her. I put on a mellow playlist and picked up all the bondage gear and straightened up the room a bit, kicking up the room's heater so we could be nice and cozy. Gravity pulled me to the inviting bed and I laid down with a giant sigh of relaxation. Look at me, I softly spoke to Regina. She raised her head slowly to meet my command. Reaching out my arms in a beckoning gesture, I invited her to come and lay on top of me, which she did. We hugged quietly and very gently. You are welcome to speak again, I whispered into her ear. Thank you, kind mistress, she responded softly. We began kissing on the lips ever so soothingly. We were kissing with slow, moist pecks and looked straight into each other's telling eyes. And then the strangest thing happened. I started to cry. At first, Regina responded by kissing each tear, but then I started to cry more and more. Just as my orgasm had grown steadily, so was my crying. It went from a soft whimper to really heavy tears. And then it was like the floodgates had broken. Regina did her best to try to console me. She has a beautiful maternal nature that felt so loving and comforting, but I still couldn't stop crying. In fact, it got worse and worse until I was an all-out mess. What was going on with me? Why was I so inconsolable? Regina seemed a little scared by it all, but kept reassuring me that it was okay to let it all out. We have complete trust, mistress. We have complete love for each other. We are okay. She began sweetly caressing me and kissing my neck and ear with pure tenderness. My whole body was quivering from the crying. This has never happened in my entire life. She took my hand and began gently sucking on my thumb while applying pressure to a spot on my palm. Believe it or not, it started to have a calming effect on me. I was gradually coming down from the emotions. After a few minutes, we were able to lie calmly on the bed next to each other as my heart rate slowed. I was embarrassed by the crying episode and voiced it to my slave. It's not like me to break down so fully. Thank you for not judging me. Regina reassured me, It was a release for you, mistress. It was a much-needed release. I worship you for being able to share that with me. In fact, she was right. There was clearly something that had been triggered from deep inside me. Perhaps the tears come from allowing myself to completely submit to my fears of being with a woman. My emotional collapse could have also been from feeling profound love for the first time. It could have been prompted by the direct pain and fear of feeling helpless and being terrified for my life. Whatever the root was, my gushing out clearly needed to happen. I literally felt cleansed. I felt whole and unashamed. To complete my connection, I wanted to have the real Regina with me. That was some kind of crazy day I had, I said softly to her. Her eyes instantly warmed and I could see Regina, the school teacher, mom, and lover was with me again. We stared at each other for a moment before smiles grew on our faces. Regina let out an involuntary giggle. Then so did I. The dark tone had given way to giddiness as we both started and couldn't stop. It was hilarious. It was the feeling of getting off the roller coaster after having endured sheer terror. I hit shuffle on my Pandora and the classic song, You're Fucking Awesome by Spiderbait came on, so I cranked it up. Next thing you know, we were dancing all over the bedroom together as we rocked out. She in her jammies and me in my robe. Regina jumped up on the bed and pretended she was the lead singer up on stage. As she rocked on, I opened my dresser drawer and started tossing panties up to her on the stage. She played it up like she was a real rock star. Finally, I rushed the stage from the mosh pit and tackled her. We rolled around wrestling on the bed and cracking up. As the song wound down, we lost steam and collapsed together on the bed. 
Stay there. I'm going to draw a bath for us, I said. I started the water, then went downstairs to make a snack tray and pour some drinks, which I set by the tub before rejoining Regina. She was lying face down on the bed and looked so cute in her pajamas. I sat by her and was immediately drawn to her adorable butt. I pulled down her pants. Hey, you can't do that, she said to me in a joking tone. Want to bet? I shot back. Then I started spanking her playfully. Hey, stop it, she said with a giant grin. You're not allowed to do that outside the game. Oh, sorry, I responded. I'll take it back. And I playfully licked her ass for a while. But soon she started to actually relax and was getting aroused by me licking her. So she broke it off with, let's get in the tub. So there we were, two girls in the bathtub together. I sat on one end and my soulmate sat on the other. In a completely automatic action, I grabbed her right foot and began to massage it under the water. As I rubbed her foot, I kept thinking about how incredible it was to be with a woman, especially this woman. God forbid if we ever broke up. I'm pretty sure I don't ever see myself being with guys anymore. I've crossed to the other team. Yes, I did. Then again, maybe I was always on this team and am merely awakening to that fact. Our bath was lovely. We had a sweet time talking about life, sharing stories and dreams. When we finally got out of the water, it was after 1 a.m. Yikes! Time flies with love this hot. But it was a school night. We figured we'd better get some sleep or we'd be a wreck in the morning. After we were dry and warm, we crawled into bed without pajamas. Her hot body felt amazing next to my skin. We took a few minutes kissing and caressing before settling down. We were spooning and just about asleep when I suddenly got really turned on with an idea. Regina out of it, seemed surprised when I said, can you believe how blue the sky is today? Never mind the fact that it was night. I got up and went to my toy box. I need to chain you down for the night, I let her know matter-of-factly. I grabbed one length of heavy chain and chained her wrists together at the top of the bed. I put my leather thigh-high boots on her and then chained her ankles together at the foot of the bed. She was tied in a long, straight line from one end of the bed to the other. I kissed her nipples, mouth, neck, and ears for a little while. She seemed to really enjoy it. Then I lied next to her on my back and started playing with myself. Slowly, I was getting more and more turned on until I climaxed in a quiet little orgasm. I landed one sweet peck on her lips, turned away from her, and went to sleep. It was kind of selfish, but I really didn't feel like getting her off. Good night. Thank you for listening to this episode of Owning Regina. Music was provided by Josh Woodward. The character of Regina was played by Daniela Flynn. If you like this podcast, please give a favorable review of it on iTunes or follow the author on Twitter at Elstrom L. That's Elstrom and the letter L. The author's official website is elstrombooks.com. 